Hey everybody, Father Warner here. We are in Saturday of the 10th week in Ordinary Time and we've been uh, spending time looking at and reflecting upon the first book of Kings. Now you remember that we began the study of, uh, of the book of Kings with chapter 16, at the end of chapter 16 rather, you saw uh, you know the 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 last of uh, the the kings of Israel mentioned, and he is Ahab who marries Jezebel. She is a Sidonian princess, and she brings along with her her gods of Baal. We know that there were about nine hundred prophets of Baal that were imported literally from uh, from Sidon, and the people of Israel became apostates. They started worshipping Baal. We know from yesterday's text that 7,000 of them, or rather uh, from the text in chapter 19, we know that 7,000 of them, uh, 19 verse 18, 7,000 of them continued to remain faithful to Yahweh along with a hundred prophets that we know from uh, the text itself that Obadiah protected a hundred prophets of Yahweh, hiding them in caves of 50 to a cave. So about 7,100 people remained faithful to God. To that add Elijah. Now yesterday's text as we saw in chapter 17, 18 and 19 um, or rather chapter 17 and 18 that Elijah has worked in these chapters seven miracles. He is the greatest prophet and yet we know that he runs away from Jezebel after working his greatest miracle. That is, there is rain that comes down from heaven after three years and after putting to death all the false prophets of Baal. Yet when Jezebel comes to know that her prophets and her priests have been killed, she puts Elijah on notice and she says, in 24 hours I'm going to do to you what you did uh, to my prophets. We know Elijah ran, runs away. He goes uh, all the way down to Beersheba and then further down to Mount Horeb. That was the text of yesterday and he's hiding in the cave and God says to him, what are you doing here? Not once, but you'll see that twice. You'll see it first in verse 9 and then further on uh, somewhere around, uh, yes, I think somewhere a little later in the text, I know it comes twice in the text, God will say, what are you doing here? This is not the place for you. This is not the job I've ordained for you. And Elijah doesn't find God in the earthquake. He doesn't find God in the fire. He doesn't find God um, in, in, he finds God in the still small voice. Now, God cares for Elijah. We know from yesterday's text that through an angel, he is fed with hot bread and with water. God understands Elijah's pain, his depression, his failings, his failures and his fear. And God ministers to us even in our failings and in our fear. That's the beauty of God. But God wants us to pick ourselves up and move on and that's where our text ended yesterday where God gives Elijah, Yahweh gives Elijah three tasks. He says, first I want you to go and anoint Hazael. Hazael was the king of Aram. Aram is modern day Syria. God says, I want you to go and anoint Jehu as uh, the successor to Ahab in the northern kingdom. And I want you also to uh, anoint Elisha as your successor. That's where we ended our text yesterday. The text of today, which is chapter 19, verse 19 to 21, is therefore a continuation. It is we find Elijah now anointing Elisha by throwing his mantle upon him and it tells us of that moment when um, Elisha is literally taken under Elijah's uh, wings. So the text begins by telling us that Elijah leaves Mount Horeb. Remember Mount Horeb is the Mount of the Lord. It is also known as Mount Sinai. This is where Moses was given the Ten Commandments. So Elijah comes to Elisha. He is, he is the son of Shaphat and we know that Elisha was plowing. He is a farmer and he was behind 12 yoke of oxen which means that he and uh, maybe another five others 
were plowing the land. Now, we don't know much about Elisha, but it appears, besides the fact that he's a farmer, we do not know whether he owned all these oxen, whether the others worked for him. But I'd like to think that uh, Elisha was, as it were, uh, a landowner. You know, uh, I, I say this because very often when we think of a calling, uh, and I'm thinking of my dear friend, Father Larry Pereira, the late Father Larry Pereira, and I know I quote him very often. I remember him once saying, you know, if a stereotypical, tall, handsome, fair man decides to join the seminary, people say, what's wrong with him? Like as if, you know, a tall, handsome, fair man, and these are stereotypes, uh, belongs to, you know, uh, to a nice girl to get married. Like, uh, handsome people are not called by God. You know, some dark-skinned, small, little, quiet, you know, failure, tense. And we would say this, you know, oh, if you don't pass the tense standard, join the priesthood. I heard, I've heard this say several times when I was a younger person. So, I want to think of Elisha as not, you know, as, as they would say, some mamia, yeah, like some a nobody. But God calls not only the uneducated, uh, James and John, uh, were in a business. Matthew was educated. Yes, God also calls very often the unqualified and he qualifies them. But I like to think that God is calling a lot of educated people today to speak up, you know, to be voices for his people. Voices, rational voices, clear voices, articulate voices, which we very often lack in the church. So, Elisha is picked up. Um, he himself is a hands-on man. That's the second point I want to drive in. Elisha is a hands-on man. He has his hand on the plow. So God picks him up, picks on a hands-on man. You know, very often as priests, we end up becoming very comfortable behind a desk. I remember some years ago when Pope Francis appointed an almonara, the, the one who takes care of the charity. Uh, he's a Polish cardinal, lovely man. Uh, Pope Francis said, I'm giving you no desk because your job does not require a desk in the sense you go out in the field. I think we need a lot of uh, our institutions, our churches have made us prisoners of buildings rather than missionaries for Christ. So Elisha is a hands-on man. He's a successful person. So God calls successful people, hands-on people, and may I also say handsome people like me. Okay. So, Elijah passed near to him and he throws his cloak or his mantle over. This was a way of saying, you have been chosen by God. You know, uh, God has called you and God calls us. Yeah. Now, don't always wait for the voice of God. Maybe listening to this, a young person might feel called by God. God can use even a failure to call a person who's failed in their life to motivate you. He doesn't always have to, uh, you know, give you success stories. Yeah, I've often spoken of my own failings. Now, Elisha left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Now, he runs with a request. He says, let me kiss my father and mother uh, and then I will follow you. Now, immediately your mind goes to the gospel. Yeah, when you have three calls to discipleship, one of the calls was a young man who is called by God, says, called by Jesus, says, let me go and bury my father and mother. It sounds so similar to this text. Let me kiss my father and mother. Uh, and um, in that case, what he was saying really, let me bury my father and mother, was a way of saying, when my parents die, I will follow you. And Jesus says, well, that's too late. In this case, he's simply saying, let me say goodbye. Yeah. So it's not that Elisha is asking for time. He, he goes, in fact, uh, Elijah says, go, go back for have I done anything to you? You know, it's a way of saying, have I stopped you from going and saying goodbye to your parents? Go do what you have to do. So a lot of young people, I want to say this if you're watching and if God is calling you, yes, do uh, take your time, reflect. I took a lot of time uh, to say yes. I remember the late Monsignor Neris once saying to me, uh, now enough, you know, make up your mind. You can't be uh, dilly-dallying. In those days, of course, they pushed us a little more 
to join the seminary. But uh, Elisha, we are told, answers the call of God. And look how he answers it very effectively. He turned away, took the pair of oxen and slaughtered them. He used the plough for cooking the oxen, then gave to his men who ate. Now, what is this really symbolizing? It's symbolizing a clear break from his profession. I am renouncing everything. I am going to slaughter my oxen. I am going to break that uh, the, the plough, make a, use it as firewood. I am done. I am dusted with my profession, with my past, with what I used to do, to be totally devoted to what I am going to do for God. Yeah? And I, I see this uh, struggle even in my life, you know, very often uh, earlier as priests, today we are still attached as secular priests, as diocesan priests, uh, to our families, to uh, what's going on in their lives. But in the past, you know, when you left, you're, you were, in, if I may say in a way, you were dead to your parents. I know those who joined monastic life were never even allowed to go for their parents' funeral. And literally the day they left for the seminary or the convent, that was it. So the attachment to Christ and uh, the detachment from the world was extremely severe. Today, those lines are blurred. Right now, I have my parents living with me. Uh, my, my, my siblings are around me. Family is around me. The lines often get blurred. This was a severe calling. God says, I want all of you. Yeah, not some part of you, but I want you to be dedicated totally to me. And in that sense, I must agree, you know, that the religious, in that sense, the religious congregations see to that complete break. I know some religious congregations, even when they are allowed to go uh, for a home visit, are not allowed to stay in their home. They have to stay in the nearest convent. And one nun says, you know, it is ridiculous because the nearest convent to my family home is almost 200, 300 kilometers farther. She said, what's the point of going? You know, it's like, uh, but that was, uh, that was the way in which religious congregations express their total devotion and service to God. The world is over for us. Now we dedicate ourselves. And as I speak, I'm beginning to think, uh, you know, as diocese and clergy, all those lines are tremendously blurred. So we know that Elijah rose and he followed and became uh, Eli Elisha rose and became Elijah's servant. Now, I want to recommend to you that with this we finish chapter 19. When we meet on Monday, we will be in chapter 22 and we're going to hear of, um, on chapter 21, sorry, we're going to hear of Naboth's vineyard. I would like to recommend that you read the whole of chapter 20. Uh, it is a very interesting, I, if I get the time, I know I take a break on Sundays, but if I get the time, I'm going to record tomorrow uh, and I'll put it out. Uh, the whole war that takes place between uh, the northern kingdom run by Ahab and the Syrian king, and we know his name is King Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad, Ben, as I will explain, is, uh, is uh, as you have Bar, son of. That's what it means, Hadad was really a Syrian god. There were many Ben-Hadads. Uh, there are two wars that take place and God ironically delivers in favor of Ahab even though he was a wicked king. So why does God do that? And does Ahab change as a person? Or is his heart still hardened? Does he have a 24 hour change of heart towards Yahweh and then slips back? To his old ways. But really, chapter 20 shows you the mercy and the love of God. That, you know, as I said, if Ahab just said, Hi Lord, it is me, God's heart melted. Yeah? But Ahab took advantage of this tender, loving God as very often we do. Bye for now. I want to leave you with a blessing from the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. May God bless you, God guide you, God protect you each day. I'm enjoying uh, teaching you uh, the book of Kings and I've decided to continue to do the first readings because I've done uh, the gospel several times with you. So don't forget to like this video, share it with your friends and leave me your comments. Bye. I want to say a special shout out to my parishioners, my former parishioners of St. Stephen's. Um, uh, 
thank you for many of you watch but some of you call and care enough to keep in touch and it really warms the cockles of my heart i just finished a conversation uh, with you know who okay so uh, i've not going to mention your name and embarrass you but thank you all of you for your love and kindness bye everybody i'll see you tomorrow or on monday